the diamond sutra the dweller the dweller in peace and harmony the diamond sutra vajra chhedika prajna paramit sutra will appear to most of you as absurd and mad it is irrational but not anti rational there is a vast difference between the two irrational means when you are below logic sense of rationality anti rational it is transcendence when something transcends the boundaries of reason boundaries of the mind then words become meaningless the essence that words carry becomes meaningful it is something beyond the reason that is why it cannot be expressed in two words for instance i give you a cup of tea to taste you have tasted the tea and after you have tasted the tea maybe 2 hours after i ask you to write the taste of the tea the experience has come to you first now you are narrating that experience sharing that experience because the experience is there you will be able to put a lightness into it this is what a master does when master speaks of a particular state a movement from one psychocenter to another he has experienced that and he is now putting that experience into the words he knows that experience very well the words have limitations how can you explain a particular taste and the after effect that tea has created in you association no matter what words you use you will find each word is incapable so if it is a three dimensional effect then your gestures will be able to communicate more than what the words will communicate words will fail to communicate the entirety experience in zen monastery there is a tea meditation you have to go inside the zen garden the monastery there is a big pot where the water is boiling that is called samova and you have to sit down quietly and listen to the sound that the boiling water creates flow with that rhythm and tea you have to sit bit by bit i can understand this statement that diamond sutra is anti rational buddha will look mad to you too because he is trying to say that which cannot be said he is trying to compose the experience into the words he is trying to compose the tavajjo through the words some 
He is trying to catch hold of something which is essentially elusive. Hence all these strange sayings are there. Indeed these are strange. They are strange because the way they are put or expressed is not logical for the mind to grasp. Mind can only grasp something which is woven in the texture of logic. When something is beyond logic, mind cannot capture it. Mind can capture the words, mind can capture the noise, but the silence, mind cannot capture. It does not make any sense, not at least for the surface mind. And that is where it becomes difficult. And if you have not felt something of the beyond, It is very difficult for you to understand what Buddha is trying to do. We can understand only that which we have experienced. If not in totality, then at least in part we have experienced something. Otherwise our understanding remains rooted in our experience. This is why all the Buddhist scriptures, whether it is Prajna Paramitya Hridayam Sutra or Vajra Chedika, Prajna Paramitya Vajra Chedika, the, the Diamond Sutra, it becomes difficult to grasp within the finiteness of the mind. It takes a while. To understand. In one instance you will not be able to understand. Now a small child's understanding is his understanding. Your understanding is your understanding. And that is how you are. A small children, as far as Buddha is concerned, or his statements are concerned, his statements are of ultimate experience. You will have to be very patient. Only then something will start dawning in your consciousness. They are of utter significance. Even if a single statement is understood, that will prove radical and that will change you from the very root. This is the significance of the message of Buddhas. Even if a single drop of that nectar that Buddha is, is speaking through his message and the presence that this message creates It, it, if it oozes into your being, it will bring about a radical change. Then you cannot remain the same. Something has changed in your mind many times. Many ideas will come. But is Buddha saying? It looks so utterly mad illogical. It does not make sense. To you, at your level of understanding, it may not make sense. It is beyond sense, where all the logic, all the degrees of sense come to an end. That's where the realm of Buddhas begin. You will have to gather yourself together to climb to something higher than you are. All your consciousnesses 
you will have to stretch your hands towards the beyond. Even if you can touch just a fragment of these sayings, your life will not be the same again. Even a single drop of the nectarine message of Buddha is enough to sow the seeds of awakening in you. Even a single drop of the nectarine message of Buddha, of the awakened one, is enough to sow the seeds of awakening in you, but it is difficult. We live rooted in the earthly consciousness. We are like the trees that are rooted in the earth. And Buddha is, the is a bird on his wings. He is soaring high in the sky. Continue to soar high and high in the sky. Now these trees rooted in the earth are trying to understand the message of the birds. That is floating in the sky, doesn't have roots in the earth anymore. It is flying in the sky. Who knows the vastness, the infiniteness of the sky? He has a different understanding, a different vision, and the distance is immense. Only a few can have few glimpses of Bud what Buddha, what the awakened one, what the master is trying to do. Something of absolute value is being conveyed to you. Something of absolute value is conveyed to you in these simple techniques. If you can understand the awakened one, that implies only one thing that you will that you is if you cannot understand the awakened one or question his message that implies only one thing that you is still not ready to understand the Buddha's message, the message of the awakened one. You are far away from your journey. It is easier to say that the awakened one, the master is mad. Then you are freed of the responsibility of understanding. Then you can close the Diamond Sutra and forget all about it. On the contrary, if you say, it is beyond me, then this is a different matter. There is a challenge for you to face. When you say maybe, I am very childish, juvenile, and is still unable to comprehend the wisdom of Buddha, I can understand now. Still I have to grow into my understanding. How can Buddha be mad? Definitely I lack the precision to understand him. Then there is a challenge and you can start growing. Always remember one thing and all circumstances never decide about the other. Even if Buddha is mad, take it as a challenge. You will not lose anything if he is mad. Then too you would have gone beyond your boundaries just in the effort to understand him. And if he is not mad, then you have met with something very precious or you have stumbled upon a great treasure. Now going back to the Diamond Sutra, the Lord then said, Yes, Subhuti, for the Tathagat has taught that the thumbs 
special to Buddhas or just not a Buddha's special thumb. That is why they are called the thumbs special to Buddhas. Now look at the absurdity. As it is difficult to comprehend, however it is significant and very meaningful as well. What are the thumbs of the Buddhas? The special characteristics of an awakened one? His special characteristic is that he has no characteristic, that he is utterly ordinary, that if you come across him, you will not recognize him. He is neither a performer nor a politician nor an actor. He has no ego to perform. He is not there to convince anybody about his importance. He is utterly absent. That is his presence. This is the reason these statements look absurd to human mind. His characteristic is that he lives as if he is no more. He walks and yet nobody walks in him. When something is utterly empty, then the walk becomes innocent. That is why in Zen monasteries and Buddhist communes there is something called Buddha walk. There is an elegance the way a Buddha walks. He walks and yet nobody walks in him. He talks yet nobody talks in him. There is utter, absolute, unbroken silence. Sometimes this silence assumes the form of words. Sometimes this silence just overflows as silence. Zen monk says, Buddha never uttered a single word. And Buddha spoke for 45 years non-stop. Zen, people are right. I agree with them because it is my own experience. I go on saying things to you, yet deep inside only a stream of absolute silence flows. A silence that has no ripples, just there is a stillness. It is not disturbed by what I see. I may be speaking, but the silence remains there. You throw a stone and the surface of the water remains still, still. Not even a ripple arises in it, and the words evolve out of that inner serenity, oneness, and harmony. An enlightened one is now here, in a way utterly present, in another way absolutely absent, because there is nothing arising in him which sees I. Not that an enlightened one does not use the word I. He uses the word I. Alike other words, this word I is also used in a utilitarian manner. However, it connotes to no reality. It is just a utility, a convenience, a strategy of language, but it corresponds to no reality. When you say I, it corresponds to a reality. When I say I, it's simply used as a word to indicate towards me as a pronoun. And if you look into me, you will not find 
N A I K F. A personality. I have not found. I have been looking and looking and looking. The more I have looked within, the more the I has evaporated. The I exists only when you do not look inwards. It can exist only when you do not look within. And there is unconsciousness. The moment you look within, the I disappears. This is the entire teaching of Raman Maharishi to go within, to look within. It is just like bringing light in a dark room and darkness disappears as if it never existed. Where does darkness disappear when you bring a light into the dark room? You are looking towards you are looking in words is like bringing the light. It is a flame of awareness. I am not talking about lighted object. I am talking about a flame. You cannot find any darkness when awareness when the lamp of awareness is lit. Your eye is nothing but condensed darkness. Remember, I, or ego, is nothing but condensed darkness. In the light of awareness, the darkness of ignorance, vanity, ego, negation of truth, all vanishes. The basic characteristic of a Buddha or the Buddha Dham or his unique quality is that he is not. He has no attributes. He is indefinable. And whatsoever definition you put upon him will be unjust because it will demand him. All definitions will limit him. To define something implies creating finite boundaries. Remember, a Buddha is not limited. He is pure emptiness. He is nobody, non-existence. Buddha is so ordinary that if you come across him, you will not be able to recognize him. You can recognize a king because you know the language of the king. And the king in turn knows the language that you can recognize. He prepares and rehearses for it. He is bent upon proving to you that he is special. Buddha has nothing like that. He is not trying to prove anything to anyone. He is not trying to be recognized by you. He has no need to be recognized. He has come home. The life has attained to fruition. All it wants to wither away in the womb of the existence. He does not need your attention. Attention is a psychological need. It has to be understood. Why people need so much attention. Why in the first place does anybody want people to pay attention to him? Why does everybody want to be special? Something is missing deep within. You have never entered within so you do not know who you are. You know yourself only when others recognize you. You have, no, you have no experience of yourself. You do not have any direct approach into your being. You live in the image of others. Because of this recognition, you experience pain and pleasure. This state of duality. If somebody says you are good, 
you feel you are good. If somebody says you are not good, you feel saddened and depressed that people say you are not good. If somebody says you are beautiful, you immediately become happy. If somebody says you are ugly, you become suddenly unhappy. You do not know who you are, beautiful or ugly. You simply live in the image, in the opinion of others. And in life you go on collecting such opinions. You do not have any direct recognition or understanding of your being. That is why you gather a borrowed being, a personality. This brings the need for the other and the attention as well. And when people are attentive to you, you feel as if you are being loved. Because in love we pay attention to each other. When two persons are in deep love, they forget the whole world. They become engaged into one another's being. Absolutely. They look into each other's eyes. In those moments, all else disappears. All duality disappears. Nothing exists then. In those pure moments, they are not here. Instead, they soar higher to plenitude somewhere in the sky or in the heaven. Or they are absolutely pouring their attention into each other's being. Love then becomes attention. And in the process, everybody has missed love. Very rarely people have attained to love because love is God. Millions live without love because they live without God. Love has been missed. Absence of love within creates a void. And humanity fills that void with false things like food, attention, etc. A person who is unhappy within, who has not discovered the treasure of love within, will try to fill that gap with more and more food. An easier way to substitute that gap or the void seek people's attention that will deceive you that they love you. Buddha is absolute love. He has loved existence. Existence has loved him so much that it has poured itself into totality, into Buddha's being. This orgasmic lovingness that exists between a Buddha and the existence is the state of Samadhi, the ultimate. When you are in an orgasmic relationship with the total, Samadhi happens. Buddha has known the total orgasm. The orgasm which is neither of the body nor of the mind, either instead it is of totality. The orgasm which is neither of the body nor of the mind either. Instead, it is of totality, the ultimate. It has come, he has come to know that ecstasy. Now there is no need to ask for any attention anymore. A Buddha will pass you on the road. And you will not be able to recognize him because you recognize only politicians, criminals and people like that. This is the only vision that you have got. You can recognize a madman on the street because he will be creating mischief. But you will not be able to recognize a Buddha because he will pass so silently. 
so serenely that not even a whisper is there. A Buddha is the ocean with no waves or ripples. There is no emotional appeal. There is no turmoil. One day he rose like a wave in the ocean of life. One day he rose like a wave in the ocean of life and traversing along life's road. And traversing along life's roads, consciously he dissolves in the depth of the ocean. Consciously he dissolves in the depth of the ocean. Inner serenity and oneness becomes ocean. Verily, inner serenity and oneness becomes ocean, out of which Buddhahood is born, out of which awakening is born. Serenity is attained in every situation, as if the vicissitudes of life have found the shore, as if vicissitudes of life have found the shore of tranquility. No, this is the birth of a Buddha. No, this is the birth of a Buddha. That is his chief characteristic. But if that is the chief characteristic to be as if one is not, then he has no characteristic at all. This is what Buddha meant when he says, Yes, Subhuti, for Tathagat, has taught that the dham special to Buddhas are not just Buddhas special dham. That is why they are called the dham special to Buddhas. The extraordinariness of Buddha is his utter ordinariness. His ordinariness is his extraordinariness. To be ordinary is the most extraordinary as well as difficult thing in the world. There is nothing more valuable than this. Nothing more valuable than this. <laughs>